Yeah. All right. Colossians 4, um, chapter, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to read this one verse. We're going to talk about it for just one minute. And then I'm going to go through some other verses to help, hopefully help explain uh, some of this language and, and give you a way to apply it to your life. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Uh, the least important thing I'm going to say is that that is worded a little funny at the end. Each one implies that there's kind of a, implies that there's something they're referencing, but it's not. It, it would have been better translated each person um, in just that particular word. Um, that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The main thing I want to talk today about is uh, your speech being always with grace and being seasoned with salt. But before um, we get to that, just a quick side note. This is something that kind of came up on Wednesday, this past Wednesday. Uh, walk in wisdom toward those that are outside. Meaning those that are outside of your circle of brothers and sisters, walk in wisdom. What does that infer to me? That infers to me that how we handle the world around us in the name of Jesus is it a straightforward, we do this every single time? If we were going to do the same thing every time and then we had this one playbook that we would just follow like a bunch of robots, then we wouldn't need wisdom for anything, would we? Yeah. We wouldn't need wisdom and understanding and knowledge for, uh, for how to uh, uh, not only have the wisdom and understanding and knowledge, but how to apply it. We wouldn't need any of that if they just wanted us to follow a single rule book. But there has to be wisdom involved in how we walk towards the outside world. This is just a brief side note, a warm up for what we're going to talk about today, right? If we didn't, if we don't walk in wisdom, we'll fall into easily can fall into the enemy's plan B for us. Plan A is that he just de derails us into a life of sin, a life of completely missing the mark of what God has made us to be. If he can get you to be a drunkard, a thief, a murderer, a adulterer, a any one of the you know big topics, or just greedy, it doesn't matter. Pick one. If he can make you something other than what God made you to be, or make you believe that you are, therefore you act as you believe, if he can get you derailed, He's got you. Easy peasy. You know why he likes plan A? Because once he gets you there, guilt and shame will do the rest. He doesn't even have to do maintenance work on you. Yeah. Because yeah? you'll begin to believe that you're not worthy to even come to God. That's his plan A. That's not a big deal today. What's more important today is his plan B. He doesn't even panic when you first come to the Lord because he's got a pretty rock solid plan B. Let's drown them with love. Let's let their misunderstanding of helping others in love and love and, and how we're called to do this and called to do that. Let's, let, let's, let's, let's plant a seed of misunderstanding that they're always supposed to do this thing. They're always supposed to go into the dead waters and get the flailing, drowning people and just hug them. And let them drag them to the bottom with them. That's his plan B. Also, a pretty great plan. Doesn't require much maintenance if you believe in your heart of hearts that you're supposed to grab a hold to everything wrong around you and think you can fix it. Wisdom is sometimes knowing that when you're going down the path of life, that there's someone right here next to you, and wisdom is knowing that they're not trying to get on your path, they're trying to get you on theirs. And wisdom is you just stay straight and hope that when you walked by them, they smelled the love of God on your spirit, and they thought to themselves, I think I might need to change my plan. But either way, you don't get off track with them because they're not trying to change their plan. That's the wisdom of the Lord, and that's the, that is the plan B of the enemy for anyone who comes to the Lord. Just switch the script. Make them think they're called to be the Savior and let them drown. It's a crushing. It takes just long enough to get there that you uh, become defined by your misguided notion of, I'm the Savior who has to save everybody who's drowning, that you can't give up your identity. See, it's the same trick, just flip-flopped. Amen? So we walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. That redeeming the time is a reference that's made in other places. It's more clearly followed up in another place. I think it's in Ephesians 5. It says it in 
follows it up with because the times are evil. Never does it say to focus on the evil. Never does it say to um, obsess and twist and wring your hands and worry and talk about it all the time. It just says that if you can walk in wisdom, you can be part of redeeming the times. Amen. 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 We're not called to worry about the problem. It says, in, it says that we're not even called to judge the world around us. That's God's job. Yeah. We're called to walk in the grace of God, in the ways of God, in the path of God. And in that, we're part of the redemption of time. Amen? Amen. All right. Verse 6, where we're trying to get to. Let your speech always be with grace. Now, most of you have been here long enough. If you've been with me any amount of time, you've heard me try to define grace to the best of my ability. Um, and the one thing that I'm absolutely certain of is that the the typical standard Christian um, notion of what grace is, is that God wouldn't give you what you deserved. That you've lived this life of sin and that God's grace is so kind that he wouldn't punish you, that he in fact would save you. Um, and, and, and I just have lovingly pointed out now for years that that is all great, but that's not grace. That's just the definition of mercy. Mercy, by definition, is not receiving what you deserve. Yeah? God is also merciful. He's very merciful, and he's just... He has so much patience with us, and he will, and he is merciful with each and every one of us. It's why we're even here. It's he's merciful with those around us, even the ones that we think are so wretched and, and against God. He's merciful with them yeah. until the very end. Until the very end, we all get that walk in God's unchecked mercy, it seems like. Until we get to that very end and there's a judgment day and there's a book of life and there's that whole thing. And then, and then, and then guess what? That's why we don't believe that we're saved by mercy. Yeah. Mercy is what makes the, the loving atmosphere for us to receive grace, the thing we believe we're saved by. By faith, which is believing something you can't quite see yet, through grace. Grace is best described by, I think, but say it's, it's like a supernatural empowerment from God. To be what he said to be. It's not an empty word that you're called to be a prophet. Well, if that's just words to Brother Tim, well, Tim got a long, hard road ahead of him. But when the word came, it had a grace of God for it to be in effect, and then it worked. You're called to be a, whatever, a son, a daughter, a, just read the other words. You're, you're not called to be adultery. You're, not, you're called to be loved. You're called to be a faithful husband, a faithful wife, a loving father, love, whatever. If you can read it in this book, it is graced by God to be true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can hear it in your spirit and it lines up with this book, it is graced by God to be in full effect of your life. Is everybody good with that definition of grace so far? Yeah. Now somehow your speech is supposed to have that in it. Amen? Amen. Our speech is... Um, we talked about it before. We talked about the, the, the Tower of Babel and what happened with the lanes. We talked about the redemption of all things. This is a big, big topic we've been covering all year. Our speech is powerful. And here's the good news and the bad news, all in one. Your speech is full of power one way or another. You're either, your speech is either full of grace or it's full of poison. One or the other. Now, I know that all of us, and self-included sometimes, we like to think sometimes we're grace, sometimes we're poison. We hope we do better and become more grace. All I know is Jesus said, you're either one or the other. <coughs> good water don't make bad water. Good trees don't make bad fruit. So we are called to be a speech full of grace type of person. What does that look like? It looks like even when you're going through the going through the, uh, the the gauntlet of life and things are getting the best of you and your emotions are getting the best of you, it looks like we are called as brothers and sisters in the Lord to spend time in our secret place with the Lord and be the uh, be the supporting person for your brothers and sisters around you. Sometimes when they come and they say it's all falling apart, the sky's coming down, you look at them and you say, you know what? I was in the secret place and I saw you. I saw you, and I saw God lifting you up, and I saw I saw birds singing in the afternoon. and you were happy again, and, and you begin to release grace into the life. When they say, I'm just an old, I'm just an old alcoholic, God, I, no, that's not who you are. You're free. 
You're free in Jesus. You're, you're new now. You're not that person. Your speech can be full of grace. Or you can just vomit poison all over them. Amen? One or the other and both have power. It's why when you're younger in the Lord, the best advice I can give you is maybe you need to run from the people who only got poison in their mouth. Yeah. It gets easier over time to combat that poison, but it never gets less awkward. It's never not awkward when you decide that you're going to be a person who's full of grace and not tolerate poison. It's never not awkward to be the person who says, we don't talk like that. We don't joke like that. Stop saying those things about my brother or sister. Yeah. Like It's never not awkward, but it's what we're called to do. Yeah. We're called to walk in wisdom, not a misguided notion of love. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So if, our, if his words can all be graced, our words can all be graced. Amen? Now, I'm not saying go around and make up things. I don't need to go up to people and say, uh, you're going to be a millionaire. You're going to have a Tesla. I don't know if I should drive your millions, but you're going to go. You don't need to make up nice things. Let God's word be good enough. Yeah. You're going to be free. Yeah. You're going to have peace. You're going to be happy one day. You're going to have the joy of the Lord. Amen? If you get the Tesla, you get the Tesla. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not everyone. I don't even know much about them, to be honest with you. But I know that it's what fancy people drive now. <laughs> Let your speech be full of grace and nothing else. Seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Seasoned with salt. What in the world would that mean? When we think about salt, um, you know, the funny thing is, is that the world, uh, the medical world tried to convince us that all salt was bad some time ago, but we now know from an even scientific place that salt is not bad for us. <laughs> it's a great reference from Jesus. Salt comes from the earth. It's not made by man. It's found by man. It comes from the earth. It is used mainly by us to season our food. It's, it's, it's uh, it's in cooking world. It's um, its purpose is not to add the taste of salt. Its purpose is to bring out the flavor and enhance the flavor of whatever it's put on. It's to make whatever it's on better. Amen. Amen. So we're called to be seasoned with salt. We are called to be salt. We're going to read that in a second. What is salt? Why is this reference to salt all throughout the word, and why is it so important? Um, great question, guys. We're going to come back to that. That you may know how you ought to answer each person. So if you can know that you are walk, you should walk in wisdom in the world around you, that you are have grace in your speech, whether it's to the world, outside world, and the inside world, grace, speech is still our operation. Yes? Yeah. Seasoned with salt. We're going to come back to the salt. In Matthew uh, 3, 11, this is John the Baptist's prophecy of what Jesus would accomplish. Now remember, John the Baptist is the greatest man ever born of woman prior to Jesus coming and releasing the new covenant. Jesus said that himself. That's not an assessment of math. The greatest man, the greatest prophet ever born of woman told us what was going to happen next. He's going to baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn and, his, and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's going to baptize us with Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit, we all know what that is. At least, I hope you do. If you don't know, we got things to talk about. You got thing, nothing, you should desire nothing else on earth if you don't have a personal relationship with that Holy Spirit. He is your, it is your pipeline into the kingdom. It is the thing that goes with you every day. It is the thing that our King Jesus said, it's better for you all that I leave this earth so that he may come. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That's what he came to baptize us in and fire. Now, in some circles, and I think I've even made this mistake before, we, we lump those two things together, but there's an and in between. Yeah? 
It's not a synonym. It's an and in between. There's two different things. And I think the next lines, which is obviously figurative language, but I think it, it, it entails, it starts to point to what that fire is really for. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean his threshing floor. Gathering the wheat into the barn, he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when most people read this, they think, man, I hope I'm the wheat and not the chaff. Let's be honest. How many people thinking they hope they're the wheat and not the chaff? Am I not the only one in this room? Okay. All right, great. I used to think that too when I first read it, and then I and then I did what you're supposed to do. I looked a little deeper into this figurative parabolic language, and I, because I'm not a wheat farmer, right? This is Virginia. We don't grow that, not really. And if we do, we don't harvest it that way anymore. Every single piece of wheat has an outer shell called chaff. Every single grain of wheat has a worthless, worthless shell around it that is no good. And when they would harvest wheat, they would get it all, and they'd bring it all into this threshing floor, and they would um, beat and bang it and all this stuff. But then they would they would drop it through. They would just drop it, let it fall through the air, and they had this big fan they would blow, and it would blow that chaff off of that wheat. And that's how they separated the chaff from the wheat. They would take the good part, the part that, that had nutrition and was good for the world around it, and they, they would keep that, and they would burn the bad part. Yes, I got good news. Jesus is going to get that bad part off. That's right. That's what he came to do. He came to burn the chaff. He came to get the crusty shell off of you that is no good for anybody. He came to get the shell off that is keeping the good thing in you from being the only thing that people get. Yes, he came to make us what we already were on the inside. Yes? Now, <clears throat> how does he do that? Great question. I believe that God has multiple paths of baptizing us into this fire where he burns away this outer shell, this chaff, this, this fleshly part of ourselves. I believe that um, Jesus does that with himself. Well, if, to make that make a little more sense, I just not all of them, but... There's some very important I am statements from Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the word of God. Yeah? I believe that there's multiple ways for him to burn off that chaff off of us. And it just depends on which one we want to go for. But if we're submitted to Jesus, he's going to get it. He's going to get it off of you. Here's the thing that I've, that I've kind of grown into, my experience with the Lord and on these ideas. Here's what I've come down to. He always, always starts with the Word. Always. Every single time. The Word of God will come to us if we're paying attention, if we're talking to Him, if we're seeking Him. The Word of God will come and say, Hey, I'll just use Tori because she was so honest. That thing you're doing at work, that's going to bear bad fruit. I need you to stop that. I need you to do replace that with this, I don't know, whatever it may be. He brings attention to something. That's the word of God coming. And this is what I've learned. This is maybe the most important thing you hear all day. If you can lean into that in that moment, there is so much grace in that word that it won't even hurt. It'll be like a surgeon's blade slicing off the dead branch on the end of the grapevine. You wouldn't even feel it. Clean cut, growth back, grows back like nothing ever happened. Yeah, that's the word of God trimming those branches. That's the word of God burning the chaff off. It's almost painless. It works so well. If you can lean into what that looks like in your life and do it just a few times, you'll get excited about God's correction. If you can see or feel what the fire of God feels like through the gentle word of God. It is awesome. Yeah? After that, plan B, not so pleasant. After that, you just run through the forest with all your dead branches breaking off as you go and anything will stick out. It's a little more painful, but God gets you there. Yeah? Embrace it. That's to say, if God has spoken to you, lean into it. Lean into it. Let it trim the dead ends off your branches. Right? If he has spoken to you and you haven't done it and you're wondering why it hurts to go through life so much, 
Also, maybe go back to leaning into that word, but don't panic. God will still get you there. There are bad habits and there are things about us that we hold on to like it is like it is the only thing keeping us alive. But here's what I'm learning with time. He gets us there. He gets us there. We run from him. We hold on to junk, but he gets us there. Now, here's the difference between letting the word trim it and not. The fire pressure heat turns way up before you let go of it the next time. That's what I've learned. The grace of God. When I first got saved, the grace of God met me on my, the, the day where I really met God and really said, I'm the rest of my life is with you. I was 19. God met me that day and showed me everything wrong with me. And I gave him most of it, all the real obvious stuff at least, and it gone. It wasn't a fight. It wasn't a struggle. I didn't have to go through counseling and rehab and no, no, no. It just, I gave it to God and it was gone. It was so slick. It makes people furious you didn't take that option to hear that story. But there were things that day that I didn't give up on purpose. I knew God wanted me to give up other things. And there were things on that day that I didn't give up on purpose because I had to have something to keep me busy, you know? And, and those hurt way more down the road getting rid of. God will do it either way. But he will get you there. We're on a winning team with a great captain. Amen? Yeah. And he will get us there with the fire. The secret is embrace the fire. Don't be afraid of the fire. I know that there are times when it feels awful and you just want God to put the fire out. Seek direction. Seek counsel. Seek for the word to find grace. Seek for a new word to find grace in. But don't run from the fire. Amen? Back to the salt. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus said this in, in his Beatitude sermon. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the salt of the earth. Everybody with me now say, I am the salt of the earth. I am the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Now, just like everything else in the Bible, Jesus didn't leave you guessing. Jesus didn't, you might be saying that day thinking that, I don't know if I feel like that. This is what the grace of God on the word of God out of the mouth of Jesus preceded this salt talk. Just a couple verses up. You know the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor. I, I cut out some of the language. I put the dot out there to indicate that. He's describing what he's going to then say. You are the salt of the earth. This is what the salt of the earth looks like. Salt are the people in the spirit, poor in spirit. The salt is those who mourn. The salt is the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peace makers those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven peacemaker is not the same thing as peacekeeper yeah. anybody with no spine and no get up and go can lay down and call themselves a peacekeeper it takes the grace of god to be a peacemaker and we were talking about that on wednesday a little more about peace Peace is a little more than just an absence of conflict. Peace is a restoration of all things wrong. It's making all things right. Peace maker. Amen? Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek, the pure in heart, for they shall see God, it says. Amen? Amen. Peace makers. This is the salt of the earth. And the salt is theirs, for the salt gets the kingdom of heaven. Those who of us who've realized that this is what God made us to be. God didn't call some of us to be winners and some of us to be losers. He called us all to be salt. You are the salt of the earth. This is what you're called to be. If you find yourself feeling like you're not this sometimes, you've lived in a lie for some percentage of your day, for some amount of your life. It's a lie. This is what God made you to be. Amen? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we skip over to the end of um, the Sermon on the Mount. They go back. They go out and start doing mission uh, ministry. Jesus starts to commission the disciples to go out in his name on his behalf. And he says, 
preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How could he tell them to say that if it wasn't true? How could he tell them to say that if it wasn't true? Now, we just heard what it takes to be called the salt. We just heard what it takes to be the ones who have the kingdom of heaven. He was sending them out as, as um, let's do the list. The poor in spirit, they mourn the meek, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're merciful, they're pure in heart, they're peacemakers now. They're restoring the wrongs of that earth in that moment. And they're carrying that spirit of God. And he says, tell them you brought that kingdom. The kingdom of peace, it's called later on. The kingdom of reconciling all things wrong back to the intention. You've brought that. In case you're wondering what that's going to look like in practical application, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Why? Because it's a kingdom of peace. It's reconciling all the things that were wrong. Those things were wrong. They were never meant to be for, men, for humans on earth to live like that. Those who could carry, who could be the salt and have the kingdom in them could take it with them and the kingdom of heaven could come upon them. Amen? Freely you have received, freely give. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to get too deep into that, but here's what I'll tell you about that. If you don't give it, it will dry up. If you think that all oh, this is just for you, that well will run dry. I'm not trying to run you to death like you know we know a lot of people, a lot of uh, organizations do. But you're, you're given all of this, your grace to be what God made you to be, so that you can show the world around you what they're made to be. Freely you've been given, freely you give it out. Amen? Amen? All this is going to come back together, I promise you. When you go into a household, greet it. I know that makes no sense to most of us. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Now, um, this is just maybe a, a, a practical uh, cheater to how you learn to walk in wisdom to the outside world around you. If... If, if you can walk in the ways that God has said you were called to be, uh, merciful, peacemaking, humble, hunger and thirst for righteousness, becoming that salt of the earth that has this kingdom of peace with you, you get to this place where you can actually, spiritually, it's, I say tangibly, but it's spiritual, release it. You can release it into situations, into, into jobs, into households, into, into whatever. You can release this thing that you're carrying and storing in your heart. You can release it into a room and it can change an atmosphere yeah. in a way you can't even fathom. If you've never walked like that or, 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 or tried it, it can change everything. But there are times where you can tell it ain't landing on everybody in the room. God said, guess what? Don't worry. It doesn't get squandered because you tried. It'll come back to you. Move forward. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Okay. Jesus again in Mark chapter 9. This is where we're going to start to put it all together. Everyone will be seasoned with fire. Everyone will be seasoned with fire. Every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Because salt is good. But if the salt loses its flavor, how will you be how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Amen? Yeah. Y'all didn't think I could put all that together, did you? One <laughs> slick verse. Every one of us is gonna get that crusty outer shell burnt off one way or another. I encourage you, take the first way. Yeah? Everyone will be seasoned with fire. And every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. How many of you know that that plan B we talked about with the enemy, where he just says, okay, well, they've decided to live for God. Let's let them live for God. Let's run them to death. Let's, let's get them going and let's get them so distracted they forget who they even are. If you lose the thing that we're here to do, your peace, your mercy, your kind, if you get off track of what you're doing all this for, you ain't got the salt for the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Amen. Did we not have one other verse? I probably didn't put it up there, but when Jesus said they're going to come to me in that day and they're going to say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and do this in your name, cast out demons? and We did all this in your name. And he said, but part from me, you didn't know me. 
You lost your salt somewhere. You did all the stuff, but you lost the salt. Yeah. yeah? Have salt in yourself. Have peace with one another. Yeah. Restore the wrongs of this world. Have salt in yourself. Restoring the, the redeeming the times. Restoring the wrongs suffered. Yes, we're in this together. Now, here's the greatest news of all. When we talk about the burning chaff process, that sounds like, yeah, plan A sounds pretty good, right? Plan B, that doesn't sound fun at all, does it? And we're thinking, we're trying to find the, the, the heart, we're trying to find it in our own hearts to say, I would take that like a champ. But in the back of our minds, we know when we don't. We know we don't take that like a champ. We know that when the fire heat turns up, we go kicking and screaming, and it is awful, and we hate every minute of it, and we say we're being patient, but we're not. We really just have no choice in the matter, and God won't speed it up. That's the God's honest truth for most of us. Yeah. As I sat with all this, I'm like, God, what a, you know, this is all good stuff, I think. Why fire and salt on the same day? Why? And I'll be honest with you, it didn't come to me though this morning. I was in the back little chapel there praying like I always do, sitting with the Lord. And I don't know why, but the Lord just, he popped it in my head and I Google searched it. And I didn't know this, but guess what they tell you to put fires out with? Oh. Salt. Wow. <laughs> Did you believe that? I didn't know that. Guess, but they said if you have a grease fire, grease fires are crazy and out of control typically. They said if you can dump enough salt on it, it just puts it right out. Amen. Amen. Safety tip for the day. But <laughs> what if, yes, the word of God comes to gently trim our branches, and that is beautiful, and it's gentle, and sweet, and it leads in these wonderful testimonies. I could give them all day long of how God has done that in my life. I could tell you the more painful ones of where I was kicking and screaming and just breaking those branches off like people often do. And that's not so fun, but I can look back and say, like that song we sang, he's even better than I ever thought he was. Because even in that, I can look back, even though in the moment it's awful, nobody wants that. But you can look back later and be like, man, he was even good in that. Look at that. What if, this is the what if. What if salt puts out the fire every time? What if the greatest commandment that Jesus was uh, gave us was to love your neighbor like yourself? Love your neighbor like yourself. True love, biblical, God's love accompanied with wisdom and understanding and knowledge of how to redeem the times and have grace in your speech and be in, uh, seasoned with salt. What if salt puts out the fire? What if you, um, what if it's, it, what if it's not enough saltiness in your walk that makes you so flammable? What if just being salty, what if just walking as the salt of the earth called to be the season, seasoning on sacrifice, what if that naturally just takes care of the chaff? Yeah? What if? I can't prove that point to you today, but I do know the people who don't lean into this life of salt that we're talking about, salt life, I just, that just came to me, sorry. <laughs> we should get some stickers that say salt life with a salt shaker. <laughs> Christian salt life. <laughs> That's my marketing department. <laughs> what, <laughs> what if, here's what I do know. The people who don't lean into the life that is the beatitude life that God graced us with for. The people who don't lean into that, they are they are like a pile of burning branches the whole time I've known them. That's all I know. It's something about these beatitudes. If you just read through the whole Sermon on the Mount, it's chapters 5 through 7. Read through the whole thing and then think about the great commandment. Love your neighbor like yourself. It's how you fulfill the greatest commandment of all. It's how you fulfill all the law and all the prophet and fulfill the highest call in the New uh, Testament, the New Covenant. It's how we do it. We, we become the salt of the earth. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? And what if salt puts out the fire? Yeah? yeah? Now, if you guys ever want to talk and have need some encouragement and prayer for the, the fire going on in your life, I'm not going to rub it in your face. 
but you know the answer before we get together. What if salt can put out the fire? Amen? Mm -hmm. I think, I wish I had, I think I instinctually, we all know that, we, even when we're newer in the Lord and we're coming up, we know that if we just march forward in the things of God, that life will get better. We don't know how. We don't know when. We need great orators to articulate it for us sometimes to see what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. But I wish at some point somebody had just cut the, cut the baloney out of, out, of, out of counsel in me and just said, hey, if you just do chapter 5, it'll put the fire out. If you can just do the Sermon on the Mount by the grace of God, the fire will have nothing to burn. Amen? That's a word of encouragement, guys. So Jesus, we come before you today, Lord. We come before you today, Lord, and we humbly come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the for the gentle word you send. The gentle word you send to correct us, to lead us, to guide us. The gentle word you send to keep us on your paths. Keep us on your paths without the painful process of life having to correct us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that as we move forward with you and as we listen to you, as we have faith to not only hear your voice, but to know to respond to it without even understanding why, what, how, when. God said it, it must be true. Maybe you don't know why now, but you will know later. And we thank you, Lord, that even in those times when we refuse to listen, and in those times when we just march on, that, that you're too good to leave us as you found us, Lord. One of the greatest lies in the Christian church is that we're just supposed to love everybody as we, like we find them. We are supposed to love everybody, but we're never supposed to like them so little that we would leave them there. Because God, you are too good to leave us like you find us. You made us to be salt of the earth. You made us to be these peacemaking, merciful, kind, humble, hungry saints of God. You made us to be non-flammable. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came not only to make a way for us to go to heaven. You came a way to set us free right here, right now. And we come before you, Lord, and we say we want more of you. This is not about uh, uh, not knowing you and needing a, an introduction for salvation. This is about it. We're going closer. We're going closer. We're tired of walking next to people in life and them not knowing the difference between them and us. We're tired of having friends and family around us that, that they know we're into that thing, but they don't know why. We're tired of it, Lord. We want to be the, the salt that puts out the fire. We want to be the salt of the earth that seasons the sacrifice. And right now, Lord Jesus, we just speak that we come before you and we are in your hands. We give ourselves to you, Lord, completely again on this day. We give ourselves to you, Lord. We are in your hands and we trust you implicitly. Whatever needs to come out, whatever needs to be broken off, we speak right now. It comes out. I feel like your Lord is even putting it on your heart right now. There's little things, even hidden things, hidden secrets. Things between you and him. Only you and him know. He's pulling it to the surface now. That's not a distraction technique from the enemy. That's a God's grace. That's that word that we talk about that trims those branches. If he's pulling it to the surface now, just release it into his hands. And understand that he'll fill that dirty, broken void in your life with the healing balm of his grace, of his love, of his compassion. He's going to heal our hearts right now. Of the wounds and the in the in the scars and the in the darkness that's crept into our walks here and there. He's calling it to the surface right now. I just speak that everyone has the strength and the grace to let it go. Let it go right now while it's easy. Be new in the name of Jesus. Be free in the name of Jesus. Be salt in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we fall short. 
Give us the grace not to become defined by that falling short, but the grace to stand up and say, that's not who we're made to be. And we march forward. We thank you, Lord, that you started a war 2,000 years ago. You started a war where you said you would conquer this world, this, this evil time, this, this wicked world. You would conquer it in your name with the kingdom of peace. We thank you, Lord, that you've recruited us to be peacemakers for the kingdom of peace. Redeeming the times. Let our speech be full of grace. Let our life be seasoned with salt. We thank you, Lord Jesus this beautiful day we thank you Lord for this life Amen Amen if anybody needs prayer for anything whatsoever please feel free to come up we'll put a message out about whether or not what we're doing on Wednesday night whether it's the lake or that's another day um, tithes and offerings in the box we're having a taco-themed meal today. It's been dubbed the Taco Storm of some kind. I can't remember what they called it. Amen. Taco Tornado warnings. I don't know. It's going to be good. Please stay and eat. We have plenty of food for everybody. The fellowship.